Hi YouTube, my name's Jeff and I'm the Veg Old Guy. I received a question the other day about crimp connectors used in my reverse polarity DPDT switch video, asking what sort of connectors they were. Well, the answer was spade connectors, but I thought it was a valid question and one that I've probably overlooked. So today I'm going to take a quick look at the most common types of crimp connectors, their uses, the different sizes, how to crimp and my preferred method. Let's start with naming them and this in itself can be confusing as I'll explain. First is the spade connector, called this because it looks like the garden spade that you dig with. If it helps, think about when I built an extension at the side of my home and six foot deep footings had to be dug. Hours of back breaking work went into that, but luckily my wife recovered in the end. Next is the bullet connector, and this is a rounded nose that looks a little bit like a bullet. Then there's the ring connector, for obvious reason. Now comes to the fork connector, and this is the one that can cause problems, because it's often called a spade connector. When and why this confusion happened I don't know, but if you search for spade connectors, don't be surprised if you see forks. So I'll call them forks to avoid any mix up. Finally, there's the butt splice connector. The spade connector is the one you've seen me use quite a lot. There's a female connector and a male connector. Quite why they're called male and female, I'll leave up to your imagination. But if I don't stop showing this footage, my channel is going to take on a whole new flavour. The female connector is most commonly used as it clips nicely onto the terminals of various electrical devices like switches and relays. But remember, one size does not fit all. On this 70 amp relay, you can see how this spade connector fits easily onto these terminals, but a wider fitting is needed for these two. Spade connectors can be bought without a plastic cover like this, but I wouldn't recommend those. If they come loose, maybe inside your vehicle, they can rattle around and accidentally strike other metals and terminals possibly creating an electrical short. If you've got this sort, wrap them well with insulation tape before use. Bullet connectors are also male and female and tend to be used together. They're often used where a device may need to be easily disconnected after fitting. For example, let's say a motor. So the wires to the motor are connected using bullet connections and that way the motor can easily be removed and replaced if necessary without needing any major rewiring. The ring connector is very versatile. It's usually secured under a screw or a bolt and it's often seen on vehicles for grounding. Once under a bolt or screw, it can't come away, making it a very secure connection. Ring connectors have many size holes to accommodate different size fixings. The fork is probably my favourite connector as it prevents a lot of swearing. Like the ring connector, it goes under a screw or bolt, but it has the advantage of not needing the fixing to be fully removed first. If you've ever tried to wrap a wire around a screw or terminal and watched it squeeze out with every turn of the screw, you'll understand why I love fork connectors. And once you understand the use of the fork connector, it's hard to imagine why it's sometimes called a spade connector. And by the way, this isn't one of those American and British things where we have different words for certain things. I understand that it's called both names in both places. If anyone knows the reason why, perhaps they'll drop me a line. Finally, we come to the butt splice connector. Its job is to splice together two wires into one. Personally, I prefer to splice using a soldering iron and I never use these connections at all but each to their own. Typically, there are three colours of crimp connector, and this relates not so much to the size of the fitting, though there can be some differences there, but mainly to the thickness of the wire used. It's not easy to show, but hopefully you can see the insides of these three connectors. If you look at the small silver circles, this is where the wire is pushed in. So the yellow can take a heavier gauge wire. Blue is a little less, and red is the lightest gauge. 
Now, whilst thicker, heavier gauge wire can carry more current, there's often no difference in the amount of current the connectors themselves can handle. Also, as I've already shown, connectors can be wider or have larger holes, depending on their use. So bear this in mind when you make any purchases. Before you do any crimping, you'll need crimping pliers. These squash the connector onto the wire to form a bond. And here you can see the three colors associated with the different colored connectors. I'll demonstrate crimping with this male bullet connector. Here's a small length of wire. And as you can see, I've stripped away a little of the sheathing to reveal the copper within. Make sure the copper is twisted neatly, then push it inside the connector, making sure the wire goes into the connection hole. If the wire doesn't fit, you'll need a larger connector. If you look carefully, you can see the copper sticking out here, so we know it's inserted properly. The connector is offered up to the crimping pliers and placed into the appropriately coloured slot. The pliers are then closed to squash the connector to the wire. Now, I confess, I'm not a big fan of crimp connectors. I know a number of auto electricians that swear by them, but I've never found them reliable. This one feels loose to me, so I crimp it a second and even a third time. I've tried various pliers and different brands of connector, but for me, the connection never seems as good as when it's soldered. So here's my preferred method of using crimping connections. I'll use this male bullet connector as an example, and I start by removing the plastic cover. This can be fiddly, but it is necessary. It may be possible to slide the plastic cover back onto the wire. If not, insulation tape will be required later. Next, the wire is inserted the same way. And this time, ordinary pliers are used to squash the connection in place. Make sure it's not too flat, otherwise the plastic cover will never slide back on. The fitting is then rested on a hot soldering iron and allowed to heat up for several seconds. Then a little solder is dabbed onto the connection and the wire strands, allowing the solder to melt all the way through. The connector is then pulled away and dragged across the iron to prevent any lumps of solder forming. Once cool, the plastic cover can be slid back in place, or insulation tape can be added if you prefer. To me, this provides a very reliable connection, but it does take a lot longer than crimping alone, so the choice of method is down to you. Whee! And I think we can call that a finished video. I hope you enjoyed this one, guys, and if you did, please like it. If you've got any questions on the subject, drop me a line. Don't forget to check out my website and please subscribe if you haven't done so already. Look out for my other videos on my YouTube channel and send in any comments or video requests. So that's it for now guys, thanks for watching.